Direction Test, or better known as DART, mission that launched from Vandenberg in November 2021 and intentionally impacted an asteroid as the world's first test for planetary defense on September 22nd of this year. Today, we will hear from representatives on this international mission, including NASA Administrator Bill Nelson, who will share information about what we're learning from DART and give us an update on NASA's planetary defense program. On the line, the president of the Italian Space Agency, Giorgio Sacaccia, on the, Luci the Lucia Cube, excuse me, which hitched a ride on DART. Lori Glaze, the director of NASA's planetary Div division here at NASA headquarters in Washington, D.C. Then we'll have Nancy, Nancy Chabot, the DART coordination lead at the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory in Laurel, Maryland. Finally, we'll hear from Tom Statler, the DART program scientist also here at NASA headquarters. First, we'll hear from the NASA Administrator, Nelson. Welcome, sir. Good afternoon, everybody. Two weeks ago, NASA made history once again. We conducted humanity's first planetary defense test. And we showed the world that NASA is serious as a defender of this planet. And we captured the attention of millions of people around the world in this test. And that's because DART, as we call it, it felt like a movie plot. But this was not Hollywood. Last November, just before Thanksgiving, a Falcon 9 carrying NASA's first planetary defense test mission launched from the Vandenberg Space Force Base. And after a 10-month journey, millions of miles, NASA successfully crashed a refrigerator-sized spacecraft into the asteroid Dimorphos seven million miles from Earth, and it came in at 14,000 miles an hour, and it was a bullseye. But why would NASA do something like this? Well, if an Earth-threatening asteroid was discovered, and we could see it far enough away, this technique could be used to deflect it. And so today, NASA confirms that DART successfully changed the targeted asteroid's trajectory. Now, how do we know that? Well, prior to DART's impact, it took Dimorphos 11 hours and 55 minutes to orbit its larger parent asteroid, Didymos. Since DART's impact, astronomers have been using telescopes on Earth to measure how much that time has changed. And now the team has confirmed that the spacecraft's impact altered the Morphous orbit around Didymos by 32 minutes and therefore successfully moved its trajectory. In other words, DART shortened the 11 hour and 55 minute orbit to 11 hours and 23 minutes, and it moved it in another location. And that has been confirmed by the telescopes. Uh, it was expected to be a huge success if it only slowed the orbit by about 10 minutes but it actually slowed it by 32 minutes. Dr. Lori Glaze and the DART team will explain more about how we confirm that. Now, this is a watershed moment for planetary defense and a watershed moment for humanity. And that's why it was fitting that DART was an international endeavor. Science benefits humanity. This is a unifying mission. And thanks to Italian Space Agency President Giorgio Sacosha, I thank him for his partnership. 
All of us have a responsibility to protect our home planet. After all, it's the only one we have. And this mission shows that NASA is trying to be ready for whatever the universe throws at us. I believe that NASA has proven that we are serious as a defender of the planet. I want to thank you, Gina. Back to you. Thank you, Administrator Nelson. Now we're here from the Italian Space Agency President, Giorgio Sacocha. Hello, Giorgio Sacocha here. First of all, let me congratulate Senator Nelson Bill. You and your team made really history with, with the deviation of the asteroid. I think was is something that we can really be proud of, proud of as, a, as an international endeavor. And I think our planet can, can feel a bit more safe for the future. From our side, from the Italian Space Agency point of view and the Italian team that uh, supported this mission, uh, it was a, a unique opportunity to be the reporter of the event, we can call ourselves this way, because our Licia Cube satellite was a spacecraft detached from DART, from the mother spacecraft, 15 days before the impact. And uh, the spacecraft uh, learned on its own how to follow DART in its course towards the asteroids. And about, uh, um, about um, one hour, say, before, before the, the event, uh, it, uh, it starts an autonomous course to be ready to take pictures uh, and uh, be the witness of the event. Uh, Licia Cube had on board two optical cameras that were uh, supposed to be used to monitor the event, but at the same time to guide the navigation of the spacecraft, which was done uh, taking advantage of the algorithm of artificial intelligence. It was a very small spacecraft, a CubeSat, but extremely intelligent and smart to monitor something so difficult. Um, just to give an idea, we're talking about uh, monitoring an event while traveling at a relative speed with, with respect to the asteroid of six kilometers per second, about four miles per second. So we, um, the Lisha Cube has to watch the event and then do a flyby of the two asteroids and turn to continue monitoring what was happening. It was really, really something challenging, but when, uh, after the impact took place, you can, you can see, um, um, uh, we have prepared two videos. Uh, the first one shows uh, the last seconds before the impact, and you can see uh, the, the change, basically a little change in, in, uh, in the little dot, which is the morphos, showing the ejection of the, of the material. But of course, a second video we prepared uh, shows what actually happened during this uh, approaching of uh, the Morphos, and the flyby and the turning of the, the satellite, and, uh, and uh, getting far away. So we, what you can see in the second video is actually uh, the approaching from seven, uh, 700 kilometers of distance, then the flybys where we went very close, up to 59 kilometers from the, the, uh, from the Morphos, and then uh, you can see um, while well, well, we're getting more far away of about 300 kilometers. So I believe what you're seeing here is really, really fantastic. I remember the night when from the control center um, at the Argotech uh, premises, the, our, our prime contractor, we started looking at those images. We, we couldn't believe our eyes that actually we made it. And we made it thanks to this fantastic collaboration with, uh, with colleagues from NASA, and we are really, really proud of that. 
Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sakacha. We are so pleased that you were able to join us on the line, and we understand you'll stay on for questions. Next, we'll have Ms. Lori Glaze. Great. Thank you so much, Gina. Let's all just kind of take a moment to soak this in. We're all here this afternoon because for the first time ever, humanity has changed the orbit of a planetary body of a planetary object. First time ever. We've heard that the team has measured that the orbital period of Dimorphos has changed from a period of 11 hours and 55 minutes to a period of 11 hours and 23 minutes. That's a change of 32 minutes with a precision of plus or minus two minutes. And Nancy's gonna talk a lot more about how we know that and, and why we're confident in that number. Uh, but I want to take a moment here just to uh, give my sincere thanks to the entire team. Uh, this is a big effort. Uh, the team at Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory, um, to the uh, Italian Space Agency, and in the, all of the collaborating partners that have contributed to achieving this remarkable, uh, remarkable uh, measurement and this achievement. So we've been watching this mission. and. You know, as you heard, the, the minimum requirement for changing the orbital period was really only 73 seconds. But based on models, uh, the team had been looking at a broad range of parameters for the potential physical properties of Dimorphos. And from those models, had estimated we would make a change of between a few minutes and several tens of minutes. And so what you've seen here is that that result of a 32 minute change is consistent with the, uh, the estimates that were made beforehand, but clearly at the upper end of that range is really fascinating. You'll hear more from Tom about what else we can learn uh, from these data going forward. But it's just been so cool. The whole world has been watching this um, since uh, uh, DART impacted Dimorphos uh, you know, two weeks ago on September 26th. And if I could pull up my first image, please. We've had observations from around the world, uh, ground-based telescopes and even a couple space-based telescopes. I just want to share a couple of them with you here. This image here was taken by the SOAR telescope in southern Chile. And let me just describe a little bit of what you're seeing. You just saw images from the Lachia cube going head on, looking at an, a cone of ejecta coming off of Dimorphos. Well, here now you're looking at an image, that same kind of view, but from side on. So you're seeing that ejecta cone kind of facing out to the left. And you can see one arm of that cone pointing down to about 8 o'clock, and then the top arm of that cone pointing up to about noon. Um, and so we can see that cone um, here uh, from the ground. You also see this really bright streak going off towards about 2 o'clock. It looks kind of like the tail of a comet. And that's because what we're seeing there is this fine grain particles that were ejected from the asteroid being driven away from the asteroid by solar radiation pressure, very much akin to, uh, to a comet. So uh, very cool observations here. This image was actually taken two days after the impact. And if we go on to the next image, please. Uh, we're continuing to take images. Um, this is the latest and greatest hot off the press Hubble Space Telescope image that was collected on Saturday. And what you can see here is that that ejection cone, again, we're looking side on, that, that bottom arm of the cone is still pointing down to about uh, 8 o'clock, uh, but the top part of that ejection cone has kind of gotten pressed back, again, with that solar radiation pressure. And you can also see that that comet-like tail has now kind of split into two as it gets away from, from the asteroid. This is so fresh and such a new image um, that the scientists are still working on interpretation of that kind of double bifurcated tail. Uh, it's about 10,000 kilometers across here in this image. Um, really fascinating stuff. The learning is gonna continue for, uh, for a long time to come. Um, and so with that, I'm gonna pass it over to Nancy to talk a little bit more about the results. Well, thank you so much. It's really a pleasure to be here today. And I, I really just need to start by also just acknowledging what a team effort it has been in order to get to this moment. Um, from the team who built the spacecraft, um, from the team who so successfully led that spacecraft to guide itself to that spectacular collision, to really the team that's been working ever since that collision two weeks ago to understand what happened to Dimorphos. 
uh, being collaborative around the world in order to get to this result today. And I'm just really happy to be here as a representative of that large international team to share that result and to dig into this data a little bit. So digging into the data, one thing I want to stress up here at front is that there are two different types of observational data sets, both completely independent that were used from data collected here on the Earth in order to arrive at this result of 32 minutes for the orbital period change. And they're both completely consistent and supporting this result that we've heard of this 32 minute orbital period change. Um, if I could have the first animation, please. The first data set and method used by the DART team uses optical telescopes here on the Earth. And so these optical telescopes here on the Earth can never actually tell the difference between Didymos and Dimorphos. As it looks to these telescopes, this asteroid system is always just a single point of light. But that single point of light changes in brightness with time, as seen by these telescopes. Because sometimes the little asteroid Dimorphos passes in front of the larger asteroid Didymos and there's a little bit of a shadow. But then other times, it actually passes right into Didymos' shadow. This is a Dimorphos eclipse. And so you can see from these eclipse events that the telescopes see a decrease in the overall brightness of this asteroid system every time that this happens. And then you can also see that these eclipse timings are very much related to the orbital period of Didymos around Dimorphos. So by measuring when these eclipses happen, you can determine what that orbital period is. And I also want to take a moment here to say the DART team already did this. We did this in order to um, get the timing for DART's kinetic impact event. So when the DART spacecraft was speeding in to hit Dimorphos, it was really important that Dimorphos wasn't hiding behind Didymos or located in front of Didymos at that time, but was actually off to the side. And telescopes on the Earth, the DART team had used those data in order to get that timing to inform when the DART spacecraft should show up so that the autonomous navigation system could separate Dynamos from Dimorphos and target onto Dimorphos and squarely hit it. And we see that that positional information that the team had was excellent and Dimorphos was exactly where it was expected from the analysis of this telescopic data. So this is just to say that the team was highly experienced and practiced at already using this method of telescopes to understand where Dimorphos is relative to Didymos. If I can have the next graphic, please. So ever since uh, the event on September 26, two weeks ago, these telescopes have been observing this system nightly. And that's what you see going across here on this graph on the top. Just this nightly telescopic data, night after night after night after night, all added up there. There's actually four different telescopes on the Earth that have contributed to making this graph so far that you're looking at in this result that we're presenting today. It's the Las Capanas Observatory in Chile, the Las Cumbres Observatory Global Telescope Network with facilities both in South Africa and in Chile, and the Danish Telescope in Chile. And all four of their data have excellent agreement and are all just overlaying on top of each other right here. Additionally, the DART team has two independent research groups that have looked at analyzing this data separately, and they have come to exactly the same conclusion. So this is also then showing two examples of this much larger data set blown up, to, so you can see the actual data, on September 29th and on October 4th. And what you see very clearly in that data is these dips in brightness that we were just talking about with that animation. And these dips in brightness were confirmed by these two independent research groups, and they are consistent and indicate that the orbital period of Dimorphos around Didymos currently is 11 hours and 23 minutes. What you can also see here is that it is not consistent with being 11 hours and 55 minutes as it was prior to DART's impact event. Um, and this is a very strong, conclusive evidence. The team is very confident in of this 32 minute orbital period change. Now the second data set that was used independently is planetary radar. And the planetary radar facilities used were the Goldstone Observatory in California and the Green Bank Observatory in West Virginia. What's nice about planetary radar is that in contrast to the optical telescopes, you can actually distinctly get signal from both Dimorphos and Dynamos directly. And this is an important distinction. So the Goldstone Observatory in particular has been tracking the position of Dimorphos uh, regularly every night for the last two weeks, roughly. And from those, they have also been tracking that this is an 11 hour and uh, 23 minute period currently for Dimorphos around Didymos with a 32 minute orbital period change. If I can have the last graphic for me, please, here. 
Additionally, on October 4th and October 9th, these radar facilities were able to get some direct images of the Didymos and Dimorphos system. Here you see Didymos, um, but also directly in the image, you can also get signal from Dimorphos. And so we're directly imaging both of these asteroids and getting their positions relative to each other. And the position of Dimorphos is consistent with 11 hours and 23 minutes for its orbital period, and it is not consistent with being a uh, what the orbital period was prior to the DART impact, which was 11 hours and 55 minutes. And so this is and just another example of these two independent methods all giving you this same answer. So this is a very exciting and promising result for planetary defense to have this orbital period change of 32 minutes. It's within the range um, of the models that have been uh, studied, but it's also definitely indicating that you're getting an enhanced deflection due to the amount of ejecta, that rocky material that's being thrown off when DART's collision happened. I think it's also, though, important to put this into perspective of a kinetic impactor technique if you wanted to use this in the future, potentially to deflect an asteroid. This is a 4% change in the orbital period of Dimorphos around Didymos, and it just gave it a small nudge. But if you wanted to do this in the future, potentially, it could potentially work, but you'd want to do it years in advance. Warning time is really key here in order to enable this sort of asteroid deflection to potentially be used in the future and is part of a much larger planetary defense strategy. So I'll just end by saying that it's exciting that we've uh, taken this first step uh, to develop and now to successfully demonstrate asteroid deflection in space with the DART mission. Uh, the DART team is very happy to be sharing this initial result even though there's still a lot of work to do. And I'll pass it over to you, Tom. Thanks, Nancy. It, it's so wonderful to see this uh, result for the period change of the binary asteroid. We've been imagining this for years and to have it finally be real is, is really quite a thrill. But as Nancy said, this is really just the start. It really is just the beginning of the analysis of this tremendously rich data set that we're going to get from the DART mission. Uh, in addition to the observations which are ongoing and will continue for some months, we also have a lot of work ahead of us in order to, to really understand what happened. We're going to be analyzing the images from the DART spacecraft and from Leachy Cube to get shape models. We need to get a never before uh, in hand shape model for Dimorphos. We didn't know what it was going to look like before we got there and now we do. We will also have a refined new shape model for Didymos. There might be some revisions, refinements to the average density of the system. And that plus the shape model giving us the volume of the asteroids will give us the first real determination of the mass of Dimorphos, the asteroid that we actually impacted. That's going to be tremendously important going forward. There's also going to be intense work done on the beautiful ejecta plume that was imaged by Leachia Cube and that is seen every night by, by ground-based telescopes. Uh, what direction did the material go in? What were the sizes of the particles? How much was there? We might be able to get an estimate of the amount of mass in the ejecta plume and how fast it was moving. And that also is very important to understand uh, what happened. The team's going to be working to understand in detail the new orbit, the new 11 hour and 23 minute orbit. How out of circular is it? How elliptical is it? Is there a little bit of a wobble induced? Did we induce a wobble in Dimorphos itself as a result of the impact? And the physics simulators on the team will be simulating the impact again, even though they've already done it, they're gonna do it some more in order to match up the predictions of the simulations with the actual observed properties of the ejecta plume so that we will know what we actually did the asteroid and we'll be able to make some predictions for what European Space Agency's spacecraft HERA will find when it arrives at the uh, Didymo system in 2027. All of this information plays into our understanding of what really happened in the experiment. How effectively did the kinetic impact change the motion of the asteroid? How efficiently was momentum transferred? It's too soon to say there's a lot of moving parts in this calculation, but as Nancy intimated, it looks like the recoil from the ejecta blasted off the surface was a substantial contributor to the overall push given to the asteroid, in addition to the push of the spacecraft directly impacting. And so there's a lot yet to come. I want to finish off with one more image. 
And this is a spectacular image ta taken from Lychee Cube and uh, enhanced by the DART team to bring out fine structures. The rectangles that you're seeing are not real. It's just that in each successive rectangle, the contrast has been boosted by another factor of two in order to bring out that, that faint structure. And this is just a visually stunning image. And every little wiggle in those streamers, every little blob, every little particle that you see is a clue to something. It's a clue to something that happens on the surface of an asteroid when an object impacts it. And if you're looking at this image and a dozen new questions are popping into your head that you would have never have thought to ask before seeing this, well, that's just one of the hallmarks of great science. It opens up new questions that we would have never have thought to ask. But in addition to the science value of this image, I, I really love it because it is artistic, it is poetic. And, and even though those re rectangles aren't real, they're suggestive of windows, of windows of understanding. We're opening new windows of understanding, looking deeper and deeper and deeper to gain a better understanding of not just how to defend our planet against this natural hazard of asteroid impact, but also to understand how our solar system works and how we got to be where we are now. So with that, I'll give it back to you, Gina. Thank you so much for that update. Uh, we are now ready for our questions and answer time. Um, if there, we do have some reporters on the line, but if there are any questions for, from reporters in the audience, please grab a microphone and, okay, great. Uh, and make sure you state your name and media affiliation. Um. Thank you. We will now begin the question and answer session. If you would like to ask a question, please press star one, unmute to your phone, and record your name. Your name is required to introduce your question as well as your affiliation. If you need to withdraw your question, press star two. Again, to ask a question, please press star one. It will take a few moments for the questions to come through. Thank you. Thanks, operator, and I will call on you when I'm ready to answer for, ask for questions in the room or on the line. Thank you. Uh, yeah, hi, it's Joel Lockenbach with the Washington Post. Um, this is all fascinating. Congratulations. Basic question, is this a plausible, deployable type of technology for deflecting an asteroid based on uh, the, the results of, of this test? And also, can you just explain a little bit about why was the change in the, in the orbital um, period at the high end of estimates, just what mechanically was happening there. Uh, I know you, you re referenced the ejecta and the recoil, but I mean, uh, can you explain the Newtonian uh, mechanics of that? Do you want to take? I, I think you should take the first part and then I'm the happy part? to chime in after. Yeah. Um, so on the first question about is this a, a viable technique for the future, I think that the, uh, the DART mission uh, has demonstrated uh, that uh, we are capable of deflecting, deflecting an asteroid, um, even a potentially hazardous asteroid of this size, um, using a kinetic impactor technique. Um, as Nancy said earlier, one of the key pieces to being successful with implementing a technique like this is early detection. The more time we have for that little nudge in the, in the change in that orbital, orbital period to really make a change, uh, the better off we are. Uh, the key point of this type of technique, of course, is to uh, just give that little nudge such that the, uh, the asteroid crosses over Earth's path um, either just before we get there or just after we've gone by so that we don't actually end up in the same place at the same time. So I think this has been an incredibly successful demonstration of the kinetic impactor. Um, and so we're, you know, hopefully we've got that tool in our, in our toolkit now. I'll pass it over to Nancy for the other half. Yeah, thanks. So period change of 32 minutes is spectacular and exciting. And what the DART team is working on right now to understand. So the DART investigation team has over 200 members that are on 28 different countries. We've been meeting daily and having really intriguing discussions that, uh, that are fascinating. And we have to cut off time just so everybody can get some sleep or get back to the telescopes and do everything that's been going. So this is, this is active, what the team is actively doing right now. We're really happy to be sharing this first initial result. It is on the high side of you know, some of the models that were run initially. So we feel confident saying that the ejecta is contributing in a substantial way. 
but yeah, come back in a, in a little bit and uh, we'll be happy to share the results of those models that the team is working on about what specifically is causing that and what that means, not just for what happened to Dimorphos, of course, but what this means for potentially applying this technique to other asteroids in the future um, if the need should arise. Thank you. Do we have any other questions in the room? Yes. Hi, Jenna Biter, Coffee or Die magazine. First of all, congratulations. What an amazing milestone. Um, so the administrator mentioned that in addition to the orbital period changing, that um, Dimorphos was moved a little bit. Can you go into that and how it uh, affect, how the DART impact affected the binary system overall? So along with uh, changing it, because it still is a double asteroid system, Dimorphos just now orbits ever so slightly closer to Didymos than it used to previously. Again, this is a few percent change um, in that actual distance, and it's just slightly closer. It's sort of tens of meters closer. Um, but this, again, is one of the specifics that's being worked out, as Tom alluded to, with all of this ongoing work to really understand that. Um, but because we came in and the DART spacecraft hit it sort of head on, um, um, it just makes it be bound even more tightly to Didymos than it was before, which is why this double asteroid system was such an ideal target to do this first test for planetary defense. Um, Tom, if you wanted to add to that, please. Nope, that was exactly what I was going to say. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. We have one more in the room, and then we'll take uh, questions on the, the, on the line. Uh, hi, this is Assam Ahmed here from AFP. Um, yeah, just in terms of uh, the better than expected result in terms of uh, there being um, a greater plume of ejector um, imparting more momentum, is that result generalizable now, do you think? Um, does that mean that, you know, that you'll factor that into your models moving forward and you think more asteroids are generally like this that are of concern? And uh, secondly, what would be your next, uh, what would you like to see as the next move um, in terms of uh, planetary defense testing? Thank you. I can start on some of that. Um, of course, this is one test, and it's one test done on one asteroid. And of course, what we're learning every time we send a mission to another asteroid is we learn that each asteroid has a different part of the story of our solar system's past to tell. Asteroids are not all the same. The asteroids in the main belt and in near-Earth space have very different histories. Most of them have been shattered and reaccumulated many times. But we know that there are objects of different types. We know that there are objects that are rubble piles, like Bennu, for example. We know that there are objects with uh, diverse surfaces. So we should not be too eager to say one test on one asteroid tells us exactly how every other asteroid would behave in a similar situation. But what we can do is use this test as an anchor point for our physics calculations and our simulations that tell us how different kinds of impacts in different situations should behave. We anchor it with this bit of ground truth, and then that tells us how better to extrapolate to, to other situations. And if I'll just add one thing before I'll pass over to you for the, the next steps. I think one of the things that's really interesting here too is that Dimorphos is a size asteroid that is a priority for planetary defense, this sort of 160 meter sort of object. Um, and it's uh, the first time we've been to an object that size and seen how it reacts too. So I think that's another important point to, you know, that Tom was talking about to anchor our knowledge in and that this is a size that's directly relevant to planetary defense that had not been visited visited before. Yeah, so I'll, I'll take the, the question about you know, what, what would be next. Um, and I think there's two things that are really important here. And you heard Tom say that you know, this is one test on one asteroid. Um, and that in this case, it appears that that particular asteroid may be this kind of loose collection of, of debris out of, of uh, material. Um, but not all asteroids are like that. Some may be a solid rock um, as opposed to a collection of, of smaller rocks held together. And the way they react is going to depend on whether they are solid or whether they're these um, collection of, of rubble. Um, so one of the key things that will be important that we should be thinking about going into the future is how can we respond quickly if we identify uh, and a potentially hazardous asteroid that's out there, maybe decades away, but be able to send a mission out to look at it and get more information on how big is it and is it a collection of rocks or is it um, a solid body? So that's one thing that's really important. But actually what I just said there is you gotta know they're coming. And so the very next thing that we really need to do, of course, is to, um, 
complete our inventory of these um, objects in the solar system that are potentially dangerous to Earth. Um, again, from this size category of about 140 meters and larger um, ours is our next uh, goal, is to try and make sure we can identify those and characterize those. And we actually have a mission in the pipeline, the Near Earth Object Surveyor, um, that's intended to do that. Thanks so much. Now we'll go to questions from the media on the line. I just want to confirm that Mr. Giorgio um, Sakacha is still on the line as well? Yes, I'm here. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Uh, operator, can we feel, please have our first question from media on the line? Yes. Ms. Marsha Dunn, your line is open, and please state your affiliation. Yes. Hi. Marsha Dunn, Associated Press. Thank you for this. Um, when did you find out what day um, that you had achieved this 32-minute um, orbital um, slim down? I'm, I'm just wondering how many days of observations it took, and I didn't know if it came over the weekend or late last week. And what if, if, if Nancy and Tom could both say what their reactions were upon first learning of this 32-minute miss? So I'll go first. Uh, we had been uh, saying the telescopes would need time in order to do this measurement, and indeed they did. But I think this is really credit to the enthusiastic international team that we have that got on this so quickly, um, both from the optical telescopes and from the radar observations, multiple groups around the world that these data started pouring in. Like I said, as a team, we were holding these daily meetings uh, and also sort of communicating uh, throughout us outside of those. Um, and I think it's that enthusiasm and that teamwork um, that, you know, we've, we share ideas on there. And so it's hard to pinpoint exactly when maybe the team, you know, had complete confidence in this result. Um, but we have been tracking it for these last two weeks and are completely confident now. Um, yeah, maybe I'll speak to you the other half of the question. Um, so the, as Laurie said earlier, the, the team before impact has been spending uh, years trying to understand the range of possible outcomes of this experiment, not knowing what the target was going to be. And so they s did simulations on solid rocks and broken rocks and fractured rocks and piles of rocks and rubble piles and piles of gravel. And, and there was this immense range. And one of the things we did understand from, from those simulations is that we expected a solid rock to be less responsive than a pile of gravel. A loosely bound rubble pile would have a, a, a big response. So um, I won't speak for anybody on the team other than myself. But the last few minutes before impact on the 26th were quite dramatic. And when I saw Dimorphos come into view, and when I saw there was not a single crater on it, and there were a lot of what appeared to be loose rocks, and I, this was a totally non-scientific by-eye measurement, I looked at it and I said, this is not going to be 73 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> and it wasn't. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. Um, operator, do we have any other questions on the line? Yes. Jeff Faust, your line is open, and please state your media affiliation. Good afternoon. Jeff Faust of Space News. I know one of the factors you talked about leading up to the impact was measuring beta, the efficiency of, of the, uh, the impact on, on the asteroid. Do you have, like, a range of beta values that are consistent with this 32-minute orbital change that you've seen? Thanks. I'll start, and Nancy can chime in. Nancy knows beta is my favorite subject. Um, so uh, we're, we're going to be working really hard to get a beta. Um, it is, as we said, it seems virtually certain that the ejecta were a significant contributor to the, uh, to the period change. And so we know beta is not equal to 1, because that would have been no ejecta. But there are a lot of ingredients that go into a definitive beta determination, so that work is, uh, is ongoing. Nancy, do you want to add anything to that? No, I'm just happy that people are asking these questions and so interested, and uh, that it'll motivate the team even more to get to work and come back at you with an answer once we've done run some more of these models. I think they're working now. <laughs> okay, I understand we have several questions on the line, but I wanted to check in the room to see if we had any additional questions. Okay, operator, let's have our next um, media question. Thank you. Sarah, your line is open. Please state your affiliation. Hi, this is Sarah Schultz for the New York Times. 
I was hoping you could say a little bit more about what the continuing follow-up observation plan looks like and, and a little more about what you hope to learn from that campaign. Thank you. So the observational campaign for the DART team will continue. The timing of DART's impact into Dimorphos was actually chosen um, when the distance between Earth and this asteroid system is at a relative minimum. And so observations can actually continue into early 2023. So right now we have this orbital period change of 32 minutes with an uncertainty of plus or minus two minutes. Additional observations will help to better refine that answer. In addition, the tail is spectacular uh, in this amount of ejecta that you're seeing, and it's continually evolving. Um, and so the observations are going on in order to fully track and watch that evolution of the ejecta. Um, and so these are the two main things that the observations will continue to be doing for the weeks and months to come. Excellent, thank you. Uh, can we have our next question from a media on the line? Daniel, your line is open. Please state your affiliation. Hi, this is for Adrian Uruguay from Uruguay, the Spanish audience. Thank you and congratulations for all the NASA team. Uh, my question is, what is the largest mass that we could impact on an asteroid? And what technological limitations do we have to do at aviation? Um, the other one is, is the change permanent to the all the change we made to the morphos? Thank you. Can we, can we ask to have you repeat the question, please? There was a little bit of feedback in the room. Can you repeat okay. the questions again, please? Uh, what is the largest mass that we could impact on an asteroid? And what are the technological limitations that we have? And this, the other one, the second question, is if the change of the dimorphic orbit is permanent or not? Understand it's the largest mass that we can impact. Well, I heard, I heard the end of the mm -hmm. question. Mm -hmm. It is a... It, it is a permanent change, although we have done more to the system than simply change the orbit. We may have left Dimorphos wobbling a bit. So over time, there may be some interaction between the wobble and the orbit, and things will adjust, but it's certainly never going to go back to the old 11 hour, 55 minute orbit. So for no, no, the no, 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 it's permanent. And I think the other part of your question had to do with the mass um, and how large of a mass. Um, and I, I, I think there's a lot of factors in play there um, in just how large or how far this technique could go. Um, so yeah, I and I think, uh, you know, there's some studies out there and the National Academies of Science uh, decadal survey had planetary defense included for the first time. And it really is related to the mass of the asteroid, but then the x-axis is always warning time. It's always how much time you have to deal with this. So if you find the asteroids ahead of time, it's very reliable that uh, NASA and other space agencies can have decades of warning time, can track these things reliably for 100 plus years. Um, and so that's really uh, lets you deal with larger objects if you have that warning time. So I think I just want to stress, this is spectacular that we've taken this first step for a kinetic impactor deflection to potentially be used in the future if we need to. Um, but we really need to also have that warning time for a, def for a technique like this to be effective. Excellent. Thank you. I understand we have several questions on the line, but I wanted to check back in the room to see if we had any other questions from media in the room. Um, sure. Hi, uh, Laurie, you mentioned uh, the NEO surveyor mission, and I had a question about that. I had uh, read, and correct me if I'm wrong, that we know of about 40% of the asteroids that can cause regional devastation. Um, how was that statistic? How did we come up with that statistic? I'll, I'll give you my stab at it, and then Tom can correct me. Um, how's that? Um, so uh, we, by looking at the, the population of asteroids that are out there, we have an estimate of how many there are. There's a size distribution. We can see the various sizes of different the different asteroids that, that are in these near-Earth um, orbits. And so we have a prediction and an estimate of, of how many we should see at each of the various size ranges. So for those um, objects that are a kilometer or larger, the really big ones, uh, we've actually identified, I believe it's like 99% of those. Um, 
Um, they've been identified. We don't believe there's that many more of them out there that we haven't found. But when you get down into this range of about the 140 meters and larger, as I said, um, or you, you noted, right, that that's the size that really could cause regional devastation. So that while it wouldn't wipe out the whole planet, they're certainly of incredible concern. Um, and of those, we are continuing to make observations from the Earth base, and we also have the NEOWISE um, spacecraft that's making some observations. Um, but through those, we believe we've, at this point, only identified about 40% of that size, that population you know, that's larger than 140 meters. Yeah, I can add a little bit to that about how we, how we know this. So we've had asteroid surveys, asteroid searches going on for a long time, and so we've got a pretty good idea of, <coughs> excuse me, what are the range of asteroid sizes and also what are the distribution of orbits in the solar system. And we also know for each one of those surveys, what are their capabilities, right? What are they able to see at what, what distances. So for every observatory, we can figure out how efficiently they're able to detect an asteroid of this size on this kind of an orbit and so on. And so knowing from that how incomplete the discoveries are, you can work backwards and figure out what has not been discovered yet. Great, any other questions in the room? Okay, operator, can we have a couple more questions on the line? Gina, your line is open. Please state your affiliation. Gina Sinceri, ABC News. Um, how important was this that this be an international cooperative mission? What did that add to it? I'll take a first stab at that one. I think that's incredibly important. Um, as you can imagine, of course, planetary defense is not just a problem for the United States, nor is it a problem just for the Italians um, that cooperated on this mission. But this is a planet-wide issue that uh, if there were an asteroid that were a threat to Earth, we should all be concerned and we all need to be working together um, to identify the asteroids, which we do with our ground-based programs, the entire world with telescopes around the world looking for um, these objects and working together uh, when one is identified to follow up with observations to characterize them so that we can put them into a database and keep track of them over time. And so working together as an international community, I think this is um, you know, one of the most important things we can do for planetary defense. If you, if you like, is Giorgio Sacoccia here? I can add something to... Please do, Giorgio. I can only confirm, of course, that uh, uh, protect, uh, protecting our planet is from space and uh, from ground uh, to, to threats that come from space is, by definition, something that we have to do together. And for this reason that uh, uh, the only way to go is to cooperate at, at the international level. Uh, it has been mentioned uh, ground-based observatories that would monitor our environment. For example, here uh, from Italy, we have developed uh, ad hoc telescopes that we that works as the fly of an eye, uh, or, um, um, the size of a fly, uh, so composite mirror um, and lenses uh, uh, telescope to monitor wide uh, areas of, uh, of, the, of the sky to detect as soon as possible possible threats. In addition, as you, as you have just seen, we, we were very, very happy to cooperate with NASA with the Leisure Cube uh, satellites, and there would be many, many other initiatives that would be dedicated at the international level to protect our planet. By the way, we, we took 720 and more pictures in those 10 minutes of observation, so I'm sure that scientists will be working on those pictures for, for a long time to get the best out of what we have done together with NASA. I have no doubt about that, Giorgio. Fantastic data set. Can I also add that, um, just from an international perspective, that the next mission to fly to the Didymos system is going to be uh, the HERA mission, uh, which Tom mentioned, uh, that w is being planned by the European Space Agency. Again, a, a multinational um, uh, endeavor to, uh, to, again, go back to this system and, and get a chance to look at it again um, a little later on. Um, so again, I think the, the international participation, this is a real opportunity uh, for the entire world to participate. Excellent. Um, we'll take another question on the line. Good 
Marvin, your line is open. Please state your affiliation. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Marvin Marshall from the Nighttime News Space Report here on Twitch.tv. This question is whoever wants to, you know, whoever wants to answer this. Uh, you know, with the data that we received from this mission, how does this scale up and to what size? Uh, you know, uh, you know, would this mission give NASA now the confidence to send, you know, a whole colony or swarm uh, of, of, of these darts uh, up there? And are we going to have any on standby? You know, we appreciate uh, all your hard work, and uh, congratulations again on a successful mission. I, I'll start it and pass it, pass it to you. So we have a physics understanding of how impacts should scale with size of target and size of impactor and velocity of impactor. If we are ever in a situation where we have to uh, actually deflect an asteroid, we'll want to look at the situation very carefully because any such event would be very situational. It would depend on the orbit of the dangerous asteroid, the nature of the asteroid. We would want, we would want to find out as much as we can about it, uh, the accessible trajectories, how could we get there, how soon could we get there. All of these things play in before you can even begin talking about well, should we use one large impactor or several smaller impactors? Is a kinetic impactor really even the best choice uh, at all? Among the things that you would want to think about is if it's a relatively small object but you have to make a large deflection, you might not want to do this with a single impactor because you might accidentally break it, something we don't want to do. Breaking an asteroid is not really the best way to defend yourself from it because then instead of having one large object heading for you, you have a lot of little objects heading for you and that's not better. So um, how to deal with a single situation is going to be situational. Now, how do you turn that into a decision of what kind of ready to go capability you want to have? That's more than a science question, more than an engineering question, it's really a policy question and governmental question. So I'm gonna to pass to Lori for that one. Well, I'm actually gonna go back to Nancy's uh, statement a little while ago that more important than uh, you know, which asteroids can we defend ourselves from with this technique is uh, we need to know how, you know, when. We need to find them and we need to identify them, we need to characterize them. As she said, time is the single most important factor in being able to, to implement any technique um, for defense. Excellent, thank you. Um, do we have any other questions on the line? Questions. So I'm going to pass the for that one. Well, I'm actually going to go back to Nancy's uh, statement a little while ago that more important than uh, you know which asteroids can we defend ourselves from with this technique. Please, your line is open. Please we need to know when we need to find them. And we need to identify yes. them. Uh, we need to Hi, my, my name is Steve Gorman. Reuters. The single most important factor in being able to to implement any technique um, for defense. Hello. Thank you. Yes, your line is open. Yeah, my name is Steve Gunner. I'm with Reuters, and I wanted to know um, what is uh, which, what combinations of, of telescopes. If somebody could run through, uh, so sort of which which combination of telescopes, ground-based telescopes, and, and space-based telescopes, if they were also involved, uh, were uh, involved in, in uh, confirming the results of the dark test. So the telescopes that have been used so far by the DART team in order to get this result are Las Capanas Observatory in Chile, the Las Cumbres Observatory Global Telescope Networks in both Chile and in South Africa, and the Danish telescope in Chile, as well as the two planetary radar facilities of Goldstone Observatory in California and the Green Bank Observatory in West Virginia. But we have a lot more telescopes than that that are contributing. So that was just to do the period change. We saw some spectacular images of the ejecta. Other telescopes are monitoring this. There's actually more than three dozen telescopes here on the Earth that are involved and uh, three telescopes in space that are also contributing. Um, so I really would uh, direct you to the DART website to get that full map of all of those telescopes and their locations. Um, this is a very initial result where we've had uh, contributions from highlighting these six facilities, but uh, many more facilities are contributing to DART's global observation campaign. And to just want add one note to that, you'll notice that the observations so far have predominantly come from observatories in the southern hemisphere. This is because Didymos is in the southern sky, but it's moving north, and so in not very many more days and weeks, uh, it will be accessible to uh, 
telescopes in the northern hemisphere, including multiple observatories in the U.S. Okay, we have time for two more. So, operator, we'll take one in the room. Please come to the mic. State your name and media affiliation. Hi, this is Sam again from AFP. Um, Nancy, just uh, on the breakdown of the telescopes again. Um, so, uh, the, fir the first four you mentioned were all optical. Then there were a couple of radar. Uh, does radio also have a part to play, or potentially, or um, in addition to that, or is, is, is or is that? Um, not the case. Sorry, it's a kind of a technical question. <laughs> um, no, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of different things. I mean, really today we've been focused on this period change result, and so those are the, the six that uh, have contributed to that result for the team. Okay, great. We'll take two more on the phone line. I understand we have more. The off your line is open of NPR. Please state your full name. Hi there, Jeff Bumfield with National Public Radio. Um, thanks for taking my questions. I, I had two. One was, so am I understanding that there is no sort of follow-up Mac and asteroid mission with a bigger impactor or any sort of plans for follow-up missions along the lines of DART, that this is it for now? And then secondly, could you explain a little more about how the ejecta helped the asteroid move? So, so what was the mechanism when, when the impactor hit? Why did this additional ejecta come off and how did that move the, the asteroid? So this is Lori. I'll take the first part of your question about what, what's coming next in planetary defense. Um, you know, the, the DART mission was an incredible demonstration of this first ever test of its kind. Um, we certainly want to make sure we analyze the data and really understand um, very well uh, what we've done here um, as we think about other potential uh, you know, demonstrations that could occur in the future, either of this technique or other mitigation techniques. Um, but we are in the planetary uh, world within NASA. As, as Nancy mentioned, we have a decadal survey that the National Academies um, provides to us. And as Nancy said, planetary defense was an important part of that National Academies um, study uh, that was just released in April. And they've actually provided for us the highest priority activities um, that we should be uh, focused on in the coming decade within planetary defense. Um, and those highest priorities are, first of all, um, as we've noted, the ability to be able to detect and characterize these objects, um, that being the single most important factor that we need to know um, is uh, which ones out there are, are potentially dangerous and, and when might they be potentially dangerous. Um, and so that's the Near Earth Object Surveyor mission, which is underway. The next um, priority uh, mission that they uh, recommended uh, was that we should explore and look into a mission that could be a rapid response, um, pr primarily to do the reconnaissance, as we were saying. We really need to know if there is an asteroid that gets detected um, that could be dangerous. We want to know how big is it, um, is it a solid rock, or is it a, a collection or, or you know, a pile of rubble. Um, that kind of information would be critically important. Um, and so those are the next two highest priorities within planetary defense. Thank you. We'll take one more question on the line, and then I'll make closing remarks. Megan, your line is open. Please state your affiliation and full name. Hi there, Megan Bartels from space.com, and thanks for taking my question. Um, this is particularly for Nancy, but if others want to chime in, that's great. Um, those fabulous images that you showed from Hubble and others. How does the ejecta and plume that you see there compare with sort of the most dramatic scenario the team had hoped for? And did that degree at all complicate the orbital measurements to determine that 32 minute change? Thank you. The images of the ejecta truly are spectacular, and it's just fabulous that telescopes and in space and around the Earth are continuing to share this and, and understand what's happening. The period change is what it is. Um, this has been imparted, and so this continuing evolution of the ejecta, you know, is obviously no longer really contributing to that and creating this spectacular tale that you're seeing. Um, when the team considered this, like Tom's last picture, I think so nicely showed, you know, every little wiggle and every little thing that the Italian space agency, Lichia Cube, so dramatically shows there to understand the ejecta. Um, this is beyond the resolution of the models that were done, but is a wealth of data that the team's going to be digging into to really understand this event. And it's very exciting to be in this position to be doing this now. 
Excellent. Thank you so much, everyone, for participating, especially our speakers here at NASA headquarters and also Mr. Giorgio uh, Sococha, who is joining us on the line, um, and media who came to attend here today. For more information about the DART mission, you can go to nasa.gov DART and also follow us on social media. For additional media questions, if you did not have the opportunity to ask questions either in the room or on the phone, please follow up with Josh Handel, who's here over there, um, and uh, he'll be happy to answer any questions before your deadline. Thanks, everyone, and have a good rest of the afternoon.